D.C. and military police are on the scene of the Navy Yard in southeast D.C. for reports of an active shooter. I saw Lieutenant Adler of D.C. homicide and, and ran up to him and asked, what's going on? They were telling me to get out of the block. I said, do you still have an active shooter there? They said, yes, there's, the guy is still there. It's not safe here. Get out of the block. It's the first picture of the victim on the ground near the, interse the intersection of New Jersey Avenue and M Street. You see a man lying on the ground, a woman giving him CPR, police in the background putting up crime scene tape right in front of the CVS at this intersection. A DC police officer uh, was shot in this building on the third floor of the building, uh, possibly hit in both legs, and that um, that the shooter has uh, at least three weapons, an AR-15, a double barrel shotgun, and a handgun, and is still loose in the building. Let's go back to the chopper live. You see it looks like, are they, Mike, you have a better view there. Are they lifting him back up? They're lifting him back, one person back up, yeah. They are lifting one person back up. That's a live picture of what appears to be a sharpshooter being lifted back up on into the helicopter. And now it looks like the chopper may be moving away from the perimeter. That right there is right above where we believe building 197 to be, where this shooting occurred at 820 this morning. Again, a building very, uh, a very large building. It houses about 3,000 employees. And you see the chopper now coming over us. This is a Capitol Police helicopter. They lowered someone onto a building there and then moments later they either picked up the same person or someone else and now they have moved away from the area a very tense situation here this shooting is worse than we thought jumi just confirmed from my police sources at mpd that 10 people have been shot in the navy yard shooting in washington and as he came around the corner he aimed his gun at us and, and he fired at least two or three shots and and we ran down the stairs to get out of the building and after we left the building there were still shots in the building he aimed a gun at you well he aimed it, there was a group of us and he aimed a gun and fired our way so you were there too yes sir looking down the barrel of a gun he was far enough down the hall that we couldn't see his face but we could see him with the rifle and he raised and aimed at us and fired and he hit high on the wall just as we were trying to leave what was going through your mind Get everyone out of the building right now. Get everyone out of the building because there's someone shooting. She described hearing the shots, being told to leave the building, being told to run from the building, being told to seek safety, um, and just describing a absolutely horrific scene. He said that he saw one of the victims from the shooting was on the ground here. They were treating him. They were calling for an ambulance. And in this video, you should see this. And you could see the ambulance arriving to treat the individual. Now, he didn't know what happened to him after he left the scene here. But again, uh, apparently, some people did get out of the Navy Yard and, and, and were assisted some blocks away. We can go now to some sound with someone who was in there, like, a pow, witness. Pow, pow. Take a listen. And then a few seconds, it stopped. And then it pow, 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 pow. So... We just ran. Did you hear ran. how many there were? How many shots there were? I, I counted at least seven when I was there. Did you see more than one shooter? I didn't see the shooter at all. I was on the first floor. From my understanding, the shooter was on the fourth floor. Was he shooting down into the atrium? If he was, I wasn't paying any attention. I heard he was, but I didn't know. I just kept running. Tragedy at the Navy Yards. Multiple um, individuals have been shot. Uh, we have report of uh, individuals who have died at the scene, and we have a transportation of uh, three gunshot victims uh, to our hospital at this time. Our news partners with ABC News are now confirming that the Navy Yard shooter is in fact dead. The big concern for us right now is is that we potentially have uh, two other shooters that we have not located at this point. You've got to assume that there are multiples until you know for sure that there aren't. So the frantic search continues inside the Navy Yard for the shooter. But the bottom line is the main shooter, the confirmed shooter, the one that was at least in a confrontation with an MPD officer, is confirmed deceased. Uh, we are confronting uh, yet another mass shooting. And today it happened on a military installation in our nation's capital. Uh, it's a shooting that targeted our military and civilian personnel. These are men and women uh, who were going to work, doing their job, uh, protecting all of us. 
She ducked into her boss's office and she just saw the shooter shooting and, he, and she, whenever I talked to her uh, the second time, she said he was actually reloading. And she said she, seen, she said she was in the bathroom and she came out and then she seen somebody. So I think she said she seen one of her coworkers get shot in the head or something like that. Uh, he had mentioned there was a shooter in the building. I said I could not confirm that. Uh, we had about a one-minute conversation, and then we had two gunshots that went off near us. Uh, one hit him, he fell down, and then uh, I ran from there after that. So you're talking to a man, and he shot. That's correct. Right next to you. Correct. Must have been quite a shock to you. I don't want to go through it again. Yeah. So what did you do next? Um, I saw him drop in front of me. He was shot in the head. I left at that point because I didn't know if the shooter was coming out of the building or if I was still in the area where he could shoot me as well. Uh, ran behind the building, jumped a fence, and then it ended up um, back with the rest of the people and security folks further back away from the scene. So Josh Morgan, a wide receiver for the Redskins, grew up in the district, attended H.D. Woodson. Now his mother works at the Navy Yard and today was at Redskins Park speaking with members of the media. Um, he said that while he was answering questions about this, he said that he had tried texting his mother 30 times, 30 times he had tried to reach his mother and he could not. He had not heard back from her. Here is what he had to say about what he was going through at the time. Unfortunately, it's not the first time. It's kind of happened in 9-11 with the uh, Pentagon when she was at the Pentagon. And it happened to me when I was at Virginia Tech, you know, with the, with the shooting down there. So um, we're kind of all too familiar with it, unfortunately. But we're just praying for the best and hope we hear from her soon. Chris Van Cleve was able to finally connect with his mother. And Chris joins us now live to tell us about it. Chris. Well, Leon, she says she hasn't called Josh or her other two boys because she doesn't have her cell phone and said she just couldn't remember anybody's phone numbers today. But she's okay. We found her over by the Marine Corps barracks talking to MPD detectives. She says she ended up there because the captain she was with thought it, the safest place they could be would be somewhere where they would be surrounded by armed Marines. So they, should, they took cover there. That's where we found her. Take a listen to some of this interview. But then we heard the shots coming from the first floor. So we didn't know what was going on. So the next thing I heard was five more shots. The captain that was in the office said, come on, ma'am, let's go. He just grabbed me by the arm and we took off down the side steps. With at least 12 confirmed uh, dead at this point, I think the actions by the police officers without question um, helped to uh, to reduce the number of lives lost. We're just now seeing the scene of, of the people who have been able to leave the complex and they're now reuniting with their families. Is this at Nationals Park? This is at, at, at Nationals Park, right there on the corner of their yeah. South Capitol, right there at right. Half Street, I believe it is. You, know, you do have to wonder how did this happen. Now, you know, Fort Hood, Texas was a military installation. That was a secure military installation, and certainly you had the shooting there, but that, that man was a major in the Army mm -hmm. uh, and had access to that base. You have to wonder how did this person get on onto this facility? How did this person get onto the facility with a weapon and you know be able to to, to wreak this kind of uh, damage, destruction, and just devastation to you know at least a dozen lives and you know countless more who were wounded or who have lost friends here today? That is the one of the really big questions that's going to probably be a center point of the FBI investigation now is how did this person get into what should have been a secured facility and how did he do it with a weapon? It is a day that none of us will soon forget and could be considered the darkest day that Washington, D.C. has seen since 9-11. Heartbreaking, and it all started during the morning rush hour at the Navy Yard when at least one gunman opened fire in a military complex packed with thousands of employees. Now, here is what we know at this hour. At least 13 people are dead. We also know that one of the gunmen is dead while officers are searching for at least one other person of interest right now. The situation has forced thousands to stay inside their homes and schools and other safe places right now. The entire ABC 7 News team is working every angle of this story. Let's begin tonight with Brad Bell. He's been covering the investigation since the very beginning this morning. The gunfire started at 8.15 a.m. The gunman with an assault rifle and a handgun shot a security guard and then made his way to his apparent target. I heard about at least eight shots. Um, I think it was in the lobby. 
It was on the fourth floor and atrium of Navy Yard Building 197, headquarters of NAVSEA, the Navy command which buys, builds, and maintains ships. The shots heard by many of the 3,000 who worked there. I was in a foyer on the third floor and uh, I heard a couple of shots that were fired and it sounded like it was return of fire and then I heard chaos because people started running down the stairway and everybody, the alarm went off for us to all get out of the building. Emergency responders raced to the scene. An MPD officer confronted the gunman and was himself shot and wounded. Thousands of Navy Yard workers were ordered to shelter in place. Maryland State and Park Police helicopters swooped in and made daring extractions of wounded from the roof of the building. It certainly was uh, one of the worst things we've seen in Washington, D.C. as officers enter the building and move through the building. They were, you know, uh, making transmissions and keeping command informed is what they um, were coming across as they went through. Um, multiple victims, there was gunfire still going on. For the people in and around the Navy Yard this morning, it was often a frightening place. Construction worker Antonio Thomas shot this cell phone video of police moving in on Building 197. Nah, call Diane and Diane with the work today, because they're shooting down when she runs down the right now. The feds running around everything, niggas in the building shooting. Me and my co-workers were frightened. Um, you know, when we when we saw the, the, the police running towards us, we just got out of the way. He also showed people evacuating the building. Some didn't make it out. Others, like Terry Durham on the third floor, heard shots and saw the gunman. We saw the man down the hall with a rifle, and he aimed at us. He shot high and missed, and we were all yelling for people to get out of the building because there was a shooter, and we got out as fast as we could. And even outside, a Navy commander said after helping to evacuate the building, he stood talking to a man whom he believed was fatally shot. Heard two gunshots. I looked in the direction where the gunshots were coming from. I looked down. The guy next to me who was standing and talking to me was down in front of me on the ground. Throughout the day, Navy Yard employees and construction workers whose job had been stopped and others just wandered the area. Some, like that commander, had a lot to be thankful for. I feel very lucky to be alive today because there's other people in my section who were there who were shot in the building and also outside the building. We are learning more about the Texas man who law enforcement officials say is the shooter. Suzanne Kennedy live from the Satellite Center with the breaking developments on who this man is. Suzanne. Autry, well, we just learned his identity within the last few hours. We know now that it is Aaron Alexis. He is a 34 year old man who until recently lived in Fort Worth, Texas. He was a full time Navy reservist based in Texas until 2011 when he left the service. He is a native of Brooklyn, New York, who, according to public records, also lived in Seattle. Washington. He was a civilian contractor for the Navy. He was previously arrested in Fort Worth, Texas in September of 2010 on a weapons charge. That stemmed from an incident in which he discharged a firearm in his Texas apartment. According to a Fort Worth Police Department report, he shot into the ceiling of his apartment, into the apartment above him, who was uh, where there was a woman who he had recently been arguing with about the noise level in her apartment. That woman said, according to this report, that she was terrified of Alexis. Amid the chaos and carnage of this day. The casualty count is going up every time I hear about it. A section of the nation's capital closed in on itself. Police just blocking all kinds of streets left and right, even the bridge. Police ordered inbound 295 to 695. The local 11th Street Bridge and adjoining ramps closed. Massive traffic tie-ups ensued for AM travelers trying to get into the district. Transportation officials say 295 inbound will easily bottleneck for the drive home as well. They have to to take all precaution to secure the city. If you scan the horizon even momentarily on this day, it felt like a city was under siege. We saw FBI agents coordinating with tactical units, bomb sniffing dogs searching for suspicious but eventually unfounded activity, and even helicopters parked on the 11th Street Bridge ready to respond. A face behind the horror takes aim at the Navy Yard. It's sad, really, but it's, it's, it's the world we live in today, so. We just always got to be ready. A crazed gunman opens fire, and tonight the families of at least a dozen people have been shattered. These people we lost today were patriots. Now at 11, the heartbreak. It was the worst morning imaginable. I just want to find him safely now and give him a hug and tell him I love him and take him home. And the emotional reunions on perhaps D.C.'s darkest day since 9-11. ABC7 live team coverage begins right now. Live from the ABC7 Broadcast Center, this is ABC7 Breaking News.
And breaking right now at 11 is the word that the gunman acted alone. That is the word they were getting hours after a man went on a deadly shooting rampage in one of the most secure parts of the district. Right now, law enforcement is trying to retrace the steps of a man they believe is responsible for at least a dozen deaths. And in the meantime, we have just learned the name of the Metropolitan Police officer who was shot but has survived. The entire ABC7 News team has been on this story all day and evening. We have a team of reporters covering every angle. We begin with Brad Bell, who just got the names of seven of the victims. Brad? Yeah, we have a lot of new information to share with you at this hour, but we will start with those names. As you said, seven of the 13, and we can read them to you now. They are 59-year-old Michael Arnold, 53-year-old Sylvia Frazier, 62-year-old Kathy Gard, 73-year-old John Roger Johnson, 50-year-old Frank Kohler, 46-year-old Kenneth Bernard Proctor, and 61-year-old Vishnu Panda. Additionally, we believe that all of them were civilian employees. None were active duty military personnel. We can also tell you that there were additionally eight injured people. Three of those people suffered gunshot wounds. None of those gunshot wounds is considered to be major or life-threatening at this point. A couple of other updates. The shelter-in-place order that had been in place for this entire community has now been lifted. But the big headline is now authorities are confirming that the gunman was acting alone. Tears of joy meet sobs of relief Monday evening as Tresina Steger Smith reunites with her husband William after spending the day locked down inside a Navy Yard office building. A touching reunion for the newlyweds after hours of fearing the worst. It has been a really rough day. How good does it feel to have her in the car and take her home? Relief. Outside the Marine Corps barracks, witnesses from Building 197 told DC police detectives what they saw. Pop, 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 pop. LaWanda Ware Brown heard the shots and got out. She's the mom of Redskins wide receiver Josh Morgan, who'd been trying to reach her all day. She left her cell phone in her office. The next thing I heard was five more shots. The captain that was in the office said, come on, ma'am, let's go. He just grabbed me by the arm and we took off down the side steps. Richard Wallace knew he was safe when he reached the barracks, but his thoughts turned to his co-workers who didn't make it out. These are family members that we work with every day, and tomorrow is going to be a very hard day. Throughout the evening, busloads of Navy Yard workers arrived at Nats Park, many emotional, shaken by the horror of the day, but relieved, finally knowing they were safe, able to find their loved ones and go home. Feeling really good that she's home. <laughs> it's got to be a relief, right? It is. Yeah. It was hard to get a hold of her all day. It was a tough experience, and uh, we're just happy to be here. We lost uh, some people, and it was just tough, man. One day after the deadliest day in D.C. since 9-11. We believe at this time that the deceased shooter, Aaron Alexis, acted alone. New details about what happened inside the Navy Yard at the hands of a single gunman. The anguish is gut-wrenching for Priscilla Daniels and her family. Her husband of 30 years, Arthur Daniels, is gone. It's unbelievable. Arthur Daniels was working yesterday at the Navy Yard, moving and installing office furniture. He had a regular routine. We get up every morning at 5 o'clock, iron his clothes, and he goes to work. He always calls home. But yesterday, Arthur didn't call. His family waited frantically, and finally, his supervisor called with the devastating news. Ma said, where's my husband? And he said, your husband got shot in his back. I said, what? And I just screaming. Arthur had been shot in the back while running down the hallway of Building 197, trying to escape the gunman. The father of five, one son was shot to death as a teenager, and grandfather of nine, Arthur was born in North Carolina, moved here when he was two. He loved to cook, to dance to James Brown. He loved his family. And now that family gathers in his southeast flat, consoling each other and trying to make sense of the senseless. He's the best man you could ever meet in the world. I was very lucky and very blessed to find the human being that I found in him. 
Never did John Johnson's wife and four daughters think they'd hold a media conference in the front driveway. An avid fisherman and Redskins fan, Johnson always set a 3.45 a.m. alarm to beat traffic. His job, a logistics analyst at the Navy Yard, his office in Building 197. And he always said, goodbye, beautiful. I love you so much. You have a good day and God bless you. When news broke Monday of a mass shooting, John's four daughters drove straight to D.C. to find their dad. Calls went unanswered. The day turned long. And when the last survivor bus arrived, they knew it wasn't good. Aaron called me from down there. Right. And said that he had not survived. I'm just in shock. I, I really am. Friends and neighbors of 54-year-old Marty Bodrog arrived at his home. It really hits. All stunned to learn he was among the victims of the mass shooting at the Navy Yard yesterday. My knees just got weak, you know. Uh, everything about Marty, just a great guy, you know, wonderful husband, you know, father. Bodrog was a man beloved by his wife and three daughters and those who lived near him as well. He was a wonderful guy. Judy McConville says Bodrog and her husband were good friends and sports fans. You know, and they were talking about going to the Bruins game. I think it was tonight. And they were talking about going up tonight. In Woodbridge, the family of 62-year-old Kathy Gard, a financial analyst at the Navy Yard, grieved in private for a beloved wife and mother. In Lorton, they remembered 59-year-old Michael Arnold. While in Alexandria, a longtime next door neighbor of 58 year old Jerry Reed, who worked as an information assurance specialist in the building where the shootings took place, said the death of her good friend is devastating. The loss is a deep pain. It's like an agony that we'll never see him, we'll never be able to talk with him, we'll never be able to share a day with him. The man responsible for the Navy Yard shooting led a conflicted life. He practiced Buddhism, yet played violent video games. His family claims he suffered PTSD, the result of being a volunteer on 9-11. He and his co-workers at the time were just in shock and disbelief like all Americans that the Twin Towers were no longer there. and. He had an anger towards the terrorists who did that and who took innocent people. Alexis had a criminal record dating back to 2004 when he was arrested in Seattle for shooting out car tires in what he called an anger-fueled blackout. Four years later, he was arrested in Georgia for disorderly conduct. Then last year, he shot into a neighbor's apartment. He enlisted in the Navy Reserves in 2007, was an aviation electrician in Fort Worth, and despite evidence of misconduct, he was honorably discharged in 2011. No one ever mentioned anything about him being aggressive or being this type of way or anything like that, so I can't comment to say that I, you know, I knew anything about this. Government sources tell the Associated Press Alexis suffered from paranoia, a sleep disorder, PTSD, and that he heard voices. He recently sought treatment from two VA hospitals. He talked about it. He said he went to the um, VA and they would give him some medicine. While he was arrested numerous times, Alexis was never prosecuted. He seemingly had a clean record, allowing him to get a government contractor's security card, which ultimately allowed him access to the Navy Yard. Just one day after the deadly rampage at Washington's Navy Yard, the gun debate ignited again on the streets of Washington. I don't know, I mean, it's just something needs to change. And in Congress, where Illinois Senator Dick Durbin reminded lawmakers they narrowly voted down a bipartisan bill a few months ago to strengthen gun laws. The vast majority of Americans think this is just common sense. Much of the gun law debate involves stronger background checks and banning assault weapons. But today, the FBI stressed gunman Aaron Alexis did not use an assault weapon, entering the base with only a shotgun. We also believe Mr. Alexis may have gained access to a handgun once inside the facility and after he began shooting. Alexis legally purchased the shotgun at Remington 870 just one day before the shootings at this Lorton, Virginia gun shop, where according to the store's attorney, in accordance with federal law, Mr. Alexis's name and other applicable information, including his state of residency, was provided to the federal NICS system, and he was approved by that system. Approved in part because while Alexis may have been charged with crimes in the past, he was never convicted, and he was successful in having his naval discharge deemed honorable under appeal. 
leaving some in Congress and on the streets of Washington to wonder what more can be done from a legal standpoint to prevent the next deadly assault. People should have the right to their Second Amendment to be able to you know, protect themselves. But at the same time, I think maybe just doing a little bit more digging to just see whether there are any type of mental or um, just instability issues. While the anti-gun lobby is using this opportunity to speak out, we reached out as well to the National Rifle Association on several occasions today and so far have received no response. We are clearly in a uh, what might be described as a hot zone. Lowering a literal lifeline, Eagle One hovers over Navy Yard Building 197. The U.S. Park Police crew on board left vulnerable to the active shooter situation going on below, but they'd spotted four people on the roof trying to get away from the gunman who'd killed 12 people. Among them, this woman shot in the shoulder. How critical was it, do you think, that she be airlifted off that building and flown to the hospital? I think it saved her life. We felt that she was going to bleed to death if she was left on the roof there. Sergeant David Tolson was the paramedic operating the chopper's hoist. He first lowered a SWAT officer onto the roof. He, along with, with the civilian personnel on the roof, loaded the wounded woman uh, into our rescue basket. We hoisted that basket up to the side of the aircraft. Uh, and then flew her directly to the MedStar unit of Washington Hospital Center. Talk to me about that moment when you got this wounded woman to safety. Well, it's, it's, it's a work in progress. You're not in safety until we got to the hospital, and, and I, I felt that she was going to be okay. Pilot Ken Birchall then flew back to Building 197. There were still three people trapped on the roof with the shooter in the building below. We needed to get those people out of there, uh, and so one by one we went back and uh, picked each one up. Now also on board that helicopter was a park police officer with an M16. He was there to engage the suspect if necessary. Their faces are mostly somber. Many of the 15,000 who work at the Navy Yard are trudging up M Street, returning to the base only to retrieve cars left behind during the evacuation. Still kind of sad. Just sad. Sad for everybody. All my coworkers. The base commander says today is a day of healing and transition. Tomorrow, he hopes to begin the return to normal operations. People here have been absolutely fabulous, and the morale is high, and everyone continues to work for the mission. That staff will not be returning to Building 197 just yet. That is still an FBI crime scene. The investigation now focusing more and more on the apparently deteriorating mental health of gunman Aaron Alexis. It's being reported that the man who murdered 12 people Monday had been complaining of hearing voices and told police in Rhode Island he was being followed. The Washington Post reports he'd carved two strange phrases into the shotgun he used in his massacre. Quote, better off this way and my ELF weapon. The FBI offers no explanation. Concern continues to grow about how a seemingly troubled Alexis kept his security clearance. The Department of Defense is promising a full investigation into how the red flags were missed. And tonight, members of the Navy Yard Police Department are claiming that budget cuts contributed to the death toll. At the minimum, you should have 11 people on, at the Navy Yard to stand post. We only had six. Police union official Anthony Mealy says they were manning gates. Only the Navy Yard chief and a major were available to respond to the shooting in Building 197. If we had an adequate amount of officers, we believe we could have entered that building and uh, we, we could have engaged that, 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 that individual. Well, very serious allegations being made by the police union, the police, civilian police officers who work here at the Navy Yard. We asked a spokesperson for the Naval District Washington to respond to that, and they said it is not the time yet to be getting into that. They're worried about healing and getting this base back in business. At the Capitol Police also responded to Monday's shooting, but there were some new allegations tonight that those officers were called back to Capitol Hill and therefore were not there on hand to stop that violence at the Navy Yard. Chris Van Cleve is live in southeast Washington tonight with a look at how Capitol Police are now responding to these allegations. Chris. Well, Leon, we're learning the Capitol Police have launched an investigation into allegations that a four-member heavily armed tactical team 
was told by a supervisor to stand down early in the response to this active shooter at the Navy Yard. Now, Capitol Police spokeswoman Lieutenant Kim Schneider says Chief Kim Dine opened a preliminary investigation into the allegations presented. She added Capitol Police did provide mutual support during the incident. She did not elaborate on what mutual support means. Now, this investigation follows a BBC report claiming a four man containment and emergency response team were among the very first tactical officers, people armed with military, military style assault weapons and body armor to arrive on the scene. It was that CERT team who was allegedly told over the radio by a watch commander to stand down and not engage the shooter. Now, an MPD spokeswoman today refused to comment on these allegations. She did say, however, that MPD officers were on scene within two minutes and were in the building within seven minutes looking for the shooter. Now, we should tell you that the Capitol Police primary function is to guard and secure the Capitol complex and Capitol grounds. Part of the Capitol was locked down during this incident. There is no timeline for the investigation. Frightening video from inside the Navy Yard the day Aaron Alexis killed 12 people. We're now learning what motivated him to open fire. Multiple indicators that Alexis held a delusional belief that he was being controlled or influenced by extremely low frequency. Tonight, new details about Alexis's days leading up to the shooting and what he etched on his weapons. The video is chilling. It begins with Aaron Alexis arriving in his rental Prius. He walks calmly into building 197 with a backpack. When you see him again, he has his gun at the ready as he stalks hallways seeking victims. He goes in and out of doors with his sawed off shotgun. The FBI video shows no active gunfire, but look closely at the last clip. Down the hallway, you can see people scrambling for cover as the gunman approaches. The FBI says those victims were chosen at random, and Alexis knew how his rampage would end. They accepted death as the inevitable consequence of his actions. The FBI also claimed today that the only motive for the shooting was Alexis's delusional belief that he was being controlled by extremely low frequency waves. On his gun, which we can now show you, they found these phrases, end to the torment, not what y'all say, better off this way, and my ELF weapon. In addition, a document retrieved from the electronic media stated, quote, ultra low frequency attack is what I've been subject to for the last three months. And to be perfectly honest, that is what has driven me to this. FBI Assistant Director Parlave says Alexis was loose in the massive building for an hour, longer than we'd heard before. She won't comment on possible background check mistakes, which gave Alexis that ID card you can see on his belt just below the gun. She says three days before the attack, he was the subject of a job performance issue, but that ended without violence. U.S. Attorney Ron Machen says the evidence tells an all too familiar story. Uh, was a mentally unstable individual, and he was able uh, to obtain a firearm uh, two days before he carried out an attack that was planned to kill as many innocent civilians uh, as possible. In the aftermath of Monday's shootings, gun control critics are again raising questions about Virginia's gun laws. The gunman bought uh, the shotgun used in the attack last weekend at a gun store in Lorton. That's where our Northern Virginia Bureau Chief uh, Jeff Goldberg is tonight. Uh, Jeff, uh, this we know is not the first time that uh, Virginia's gun laws have come into question. That's right, Maureen. That was certainly the case after Virginia Tech, and the pattern has followed after other mass shootings like Aurora, Newtown, and now Washington. It is the gun shop now forever linked to the Navy Yard shooting, but the attorney for sharpshooters small arms range in Lorton says the store is not to blame for the tragedy. The dealer's always going to get some question about it, as did they follow the rules. The easy, the easy news here is Yes, they did. Michael Slocum says on Saturday the 14th, Aaron Alexis visited sharpshooters where he rented an AR-15 rifle, bought ammo, then used the firing range. Slocum says Alexis did not attempt to buy an assault rifle, but did ask about buying a handgun. He was told that as an out-of-state resident, it would have to be delivered to his home state of Texas. Instead, Alexis bought a Remington 870 Express shotgun like this, plus ammo, a purchase approved following state and federal background checks in just four minutes. It was an ordinary transaction. 
happens hundreds of times a day. Killed by gun. Wednesday at the Capitol, families impacted by gun violence, including Virginia Tech and Newtown, called the Navy Yard shooting yet another example of the need for expanded background checks. Will it solve all problems? No. Will it solve uh, mass shootings? Rarely. But would it bring down 30,000 deaths a year to something a little bit lower? Probably. At Blue Ridge Arsenal in Chantilly, owner Earl Curtis says tighter gun laws are not the answer. What needs to happen, he says, is for more information to be included in current checks, like the gun-related charges and mental health issues connected to Aaron Alexis. Unfortunately, his information wasn't in this background check, and it should have been, because he would have never been allowed to purchase that gun. Earlier this year, gun control advocates did try to pass tighter gun laws during the General Assembly in Richmond, but the majority of those efforts failed. Kathleen Alexis read a statement from her home in New York today. This is lawmakers learn from the Veterans Affairs Department today that Alexis was given medication for insomnia during two VA hospital visits last month, but that he denied being depressed or wanting to hurt anyone. Nobody seems to know why, not even Aaron Alexis's mother. I don't know why he did what he did, and I'll never be able to ask him why. Aaron is now in a place where he can no longer do harm to anyone, and for that I am glad. As recently as August 7th, Alexis called police to his Newport, Rhode Island hotel, saying an unidentified person had sent three people to follow him and keep him awake by talking to him and sending vibrations to his body through a microwave machine. Richard Cooter, head of George Washington University's forensic psychology program, says delusions and workplace grievances are not reliable predictors of mass murderers. If you tried to put them together in an instrument to identify shooters, you'd falsely identify lots of people who also have legal rights, as they should. Sources say Alexis had been treated by the VA for mental problems, and as a Navy reservist, he'd been cited for insubordination and disorderly conduct, but he kept his security clearance. Looking at the offenses while he was in the Navy, the, the offenses while he was in uniform, uh, none of those give you an indication that he was capable of this sort of brutal, vicious violence. That was unleashed Monday in Building 197. To the families of the victims, I am so, so very sorry that this has happened. My heart is broken. Steve Chenevy went looking for the answers. He's in the newsroom tonight with what he found. Steve. You know, Gordon, the issue of gaining and maintaining security clearance has really come under fire with these recent revelations. If you want security clearance, this is the paperwork you need to fill out. 127 pages worth. It is an epic process. Now done and reviewed almost exclusively online with 93% of applications electronically processed last year. There is no denying the red flags that have surfaced after the Navy Yard attack and the question of how Aaron Alexis was able to maintain his security clearance despite brushes with the law and questions surrounding his mental health. There's a gap in the system. Uh, the gap tends to be where someone has already gotten their clearance and it's basically left on an honor system for the person to report it. Attorney John Barry has nearly two decades experience helping people obtain or maintain security clearance. He knows every step of the process and says he can't believe Alexis slipped through the cracks. But when it comes to clearance, the sheer numbers are staggering. OPM did nearly 3.3 million investigations last year, checking more than 23 million items, which breaks down to 2,600 checks per minute. The security application for each person is a hefty 127 pages with Section 21 getting a lot of attention, where you no longer have to divulge mental health treatment if it's not court-ordered or if it is combat-related. Now, retired General Pete Chiarelli fought for that change and thinks altering it now would be a huge mistake. Senator Mark Warner agrees. I also don't want the number of our veterans who've come back that have been challenged with some level of PTSD to somehow feel, oh my gosh, I can't acknowledge those issues. As a whole, the amount of information considered for security clearance has increased up to 58 percent since 2005, while applications are being processed nearly four times faster. Two equations, Barry says, add up to the greater potential for error. The government has sort of moved towards let's ask more questions, but spend less time looking at the answers.
We've really been studying this all week. By the guidelines put in place now, it doesn't appear that there was any reason for Aaron Alexis to not be given security clearance in 2007. However, there is still a chance of why, a question rather, of why that clearance wasn't challenged after police in Rhode Island alerted Alexis' employer last month of his erratic behavior. A question neither that contractor nor the Navy has an answer to this evening as we continue to learn more about the security process. While there are still many questions surrounding Aaron Alexis's actions, the government, the military, and the private contractor involved all claim no red flag surfaced during his initial security clearance in 2007. The Office of Personnel Management reviewed the 2007 background investigation file for Aaron Alexis, and the agency believes that the file was complete and in compliance with all investigative standards. Government contractor USIS performed Alexis's background investigation, the same company which did the security screening on NSA leaker Edward Snowden. It's one of three companies OPM contracts with, which collectively performs 70 percent of the government's security screenings. A spokesman for USIS declined a request for comment on Alexis's screening, saying only that we are contractually prohibited from retaining case information. One security screener, however, who does not work for USIS, reached out to ABC7 complaining of inadequate regulations and much-needed government reform. Look, I would love to say it would have prevented it, but we never know that for sure. Senator John Tester has been pushing legislation to change the background check process since the Snowden case surfaced. There's not a lot of transparency in, in, in the background check process. Uh, the SCORE Act would allow us some transparency so as policymakers uh, we could make the changes necessary to make this thing work or put the clamps on the people that are uh, not doing it properly. The notion that you're calling what you're doing quality control, Ms. Kaplan, is probably, I think, offensive. Uh, thank you. Harsh criticism have you heard on Capitol Hill over the flawed background check system was this system that granted security access to Navy Yard gunman Aaron Alexis. And tonight, the problems have sparked demands for immediate changes. And uh, that is causing uh, demands for uh, uh, an in inquiry. Our senior political reporter Scott Thuman is live at the Navy Yard tonight with the frustration and reaction. Scott? Well, senators on the Hill today took great umbrage with the background check process that allowed people like Aaron Alexis to not only get, but maintain a security clearance. Officials who testified admitted he did slip through the cracks. And tonight we are learning there are a lot of them. You looked at Alexis's background check. Yes, we did. Well, it, it, would you like me to talk about the Alexis? Uh, well, I mean, you can, but I mean, the information's out there. But that information about the Navy Yard shooter should have been found sooner. Background checks, this frustrated group says, need drastic improving. We have 8,400 people with clearances that don't follow the law and when it comes to paying their taxes. You know, the American people ought to be asking, what in the world's going on? In fact, one month's audit of top secret background checks show 87% of 3,500 reports were missing information like employment verification. 12% didn't even include subject interviews, despite the average investigation costing $4,000. For 20 bucks, you can get 90% of the information on the internet. They suggest reinvestigating clearance holders randomly, twice every five years, and believe it could have alerted them to Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, who leaked military documents, and most recently, Aaron Alexis. The sense there's going to be more money will be involved, but for our safety, I think it's very important. Sabrina Akins works in security and government contracting. Just some people are going to slip through. Unfortunately, there's only so much you can do without impinging upon everyone else who might have had one DUI. So it's a catch-22. But to what end? We are giving the impression that all these millions of people who have security clearances, we've checked them out. We have no idea if that's true. We are clueless. Now, some very similar recommended changes were supposed to take place all the way back in 2005, but did not. So this committee today said it's going to follow up, keep a very close eye on any progress. Meanwhile, I talked to D.C. Mayor Vincent Gray earlier today, and he told me that unless we also increase scrutiny on the background checks for gun purchases, too, that all of this is just an exercise in talking. Yeah, well, Police Chief Kathy Lanier dropped the bombshell today. We already knew what happened in there it was terrible. Twelve people murdered, three others shot by the gunman. But what Kathy Lanier revealed today was there was very nearly another fatality.
Um, the heroism. Chief Kathy Lanier to told Bruce DePoit on our sister uh, station, News Channel there. 8, that it happened in that frantic half hour after police entered the massive building 197. Another one of our officers actually took two rounds to the chest, um, was uh, stopped by his, his vest. So he actually was shot in the chest in the confrontation with the gunman. We've also learned tonight that Aaron Alexis lied about a past arrest and financial problems as he was being investigated for a security clearance. In addition, federal investigators deleted any record that Alexis fired a gun during a parking dispute in Seattle. And so the Navy has announced plans for some changes. If approved by the Secretary of Defense, background checks will include all police documents, not just arrests. Secretary of Defense has already approved a move to give senior officers more responsibility for security and sailor evaluations. I'm all in favor of it. Bill Sabarino is a lawyer specializing in clearance issues. He says the system can use such improvement. Because OPM's reports are often done very quickly. They're often done uh, weeks before or weeks after, I should say, after the interviews take place, and they're not always accurate. And in this instance, the inaccuracy was the omission of important information for the government. Around the Navy Yard, workers say the need for change is tragically obvious. Well, they should have been doing it from the get-go. From the start, I always assumed that they did. We're learning more tonight about this tragic scene that unfolded Monday morning outside the Navy Yard. Those images show people frantically trying to save the life of a victim of the shooting rampage that had just unfolded. That's right. ABC 7 News confirmed that the man that they were trying to save there on that corner was Vishnu Pandit, a man who spent 30 years of his life working as an engineer for the Navy. Today, our D.C. Bureau Chief Sam Ford spoke with a woman who fought to save Pandit's life. He traveled to Stafford County to get her story. Sam? Yes, Leon, we are in Stafford, Virginia, where Bertilia Laverne lives with her husband and child. She said on Monday morning she was at her cubicle about to go to a meeting when bullets flew into her office area, shattering glass and striking a cherished colleague in the head. And then there was a rapid succession of shots. Bertilia Laverne told us she was at her desk on the fourth floor of building 197 when she and her boss realized that what they thought was a table dropping was gunfire and it was time to flee. When she ran to get her purse and key card, she spotted her colleague Vishnu Pandit, whom she called Keeson, down, shot in the head. And I immediately started praying over him and calling his name and he took a big breath and then I felt for his pulse and it was beating. Laverne, who used to be a Navy EMT, told her boss to get help to evacuate Pandit. And the boss returned with three security guards, and they began maneuvering him down the stairwells toward an exit. When we got to the second floor, uh, the radio went off and said that the shooter was on the first floor in the west, on the west wing, or the west side, which was where we were at. So we couldn't go through the building like we intended originally. We had to actually take the emergency side door exit. She says one of the security guards used an unmarked car and drove her and Pondit out of the base to New Jersey and M. Help place Pondit on the sidewalk and return to the Navy Yard while Laverne and others who joined in performed CPR and chest compressions until an ambulance arrived. Unfortunately, Pondit did not survive. Laverne attended his funeral yesterday. He was a sweet, sweet man. And he was greatly loved. And he will be greatly missed. As President Obama, D.C. Mayor Vincent Gray, and other leaders urged the public not to forget these victims, they also called for more gun control in hopes of preventing another mass shooting. Jay Korf is in Southeast Washington with reaction to the messages today. Jay. Well, Kenneth, this memorial was about remembering the fallen, helping heal the heartbroken, and putting a stop to gun violence. Under a flag lowered to half-staff, a nation paused to honor the victims of last Monday's Navy Yard shooting. An ordinary Monday became a day of extraordinary horror, but also extraordinary heroism. A day that claimed 12 lives and left a country wondering how anyone could unleash such madness. Once more, our hearts are broken. Once more, 
We ask why. President Barack Obama addressed a crowd of thousands. Our tears are not enough. Our words and our prayers are not enough. He stressed a wave of mass shootings in recent years should inspire us, even obligate us, to change. Wisdom comes through the recognition that tragedies such as this are not inevitable and that we possess the ability to act and to change and to spare others the pain that drops upon our hearts. His call to action resonated with those we spoke with after the memorial service. He did what he had to do. He said what he had to say, and he was, I think it was, it was great. Including Karen Martin, who hid in Building 197 while the shooter gunned down her co-workers. We ran, we hid until time for them to let us off the base. And Kenneth and Felicia Johnson are related to victim Kenneth Proctor. All the families needed uh, comforting words. But then again, you know, the truth of the matter is, you know, there is a lot of gun violence issues right now. So I think the change was just right. I think that it's a blessing for all the families to know that all of us as Americans are mourning with them and that we really feel their tragedy and their pain. And District Mayor Vincent Gray also did not mince his words on Monday, saying during his remarks, quote, our country is drowning in a sea of guns. But President Obama did stress that he does not believe that Washington alone can solve this issue of gun violence. He says that the only way that a change can be made is if America speaks out. Live in Southeast, Jay Corf. ABC 7 News. It was a difficult service to watch, eh? Thank you. The National Rifle Association is also weighing in for the first time today on the Navy Yard shootings. During an appearance on Meet the Press, NRA's Executive Vice President Wayne Lapierre said that more personnel who work at military facilities should be armed so they can stop attacks. No, the whole country, David, knows the problem is there weren't enough good guys with guns. When the good guys with guns got there, it stopped. I mean, what really happened here, the mental health situation in the country is in complete breakdown. And I LaPierre also said that greater efforts are needed to identify and lock up mentally ill people who are dangerous. The Navy Yard shooter, Aaron Alexis, had a history of violent outbursts and was in the early stages of being treated by the Veterans Administration for serious mental problems. A Navy Yard Victim Assistance Response Line is available for those impacted by the shootings. The number to call is 1-866-962-5048. Counselors will be available around the clock to talk with victims, their families, witnesses, survivors of the Navy Yard shooting. And this reminder to stay with us here at ABC7 and WJLA.com for any new developments in the Navy Yard shooting. It is very demoralizing to see mass shooting after mass shooting in this country. Dozens of gun control advocates gathered near the scene of Monday's mass shooting at the Navy Yard to remember the victims and to cry the violence that claimed 12 innocent lives. You know, it, it was a sense of fear, it was a sense of anger, and it was a sense of disbelief. Shannon Watts founded Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America after Sandy Hook. How do we live in a country that allows this to keep happening? Ironically, she was en route to the U.S. Capitol to lobby for gun reform when police allege suspect 34-year-old contractor Aaron Alexis started his killing spree. I wonder what it's going to take to get our, our, our cowardly, lazy Congress to get off of their behinds and to protect us as they protected themselves when they went on lockdown during this mass shooting on Monday. The FBI won't discuss the suspect's criminal or medical history, but according to friends, Alexis had struggled with financial and emotional demons shooting who is finally speaking out two months to the day of the tragedy. D.C. police officer Scott Williams is recovering from gunshot wounds to his legs, and tonight he attended a fundraiser held in his honor in Northwest. Robert Lyle spoke with the officer, and he's here now with that interview. Robert. Candace, Officer Williams tells me that he's talked about the Navy Yard shooting just a handful of times and only to close friends. So as we talked tonight, it was clear the memories are still too raw for him to discuss on camera. Yet, as you're about to see, he's all smiles and standing tonight. <laughs> Officer Scott Williams was embraced by applause outside Kelly's Irish Times in Northwest tonight. That's all I can say is thanks for all the support. But the officer who came face to face with Navy Yard shooter Aaron Alexis and survived was overwhelmed as he faced the renegade pigs, fellow officers who organized this fundraiser. Somebody's going to have to cut his grass when they can't walk. Somebody's going to have to shovel his driveway. Officers are used to making 
tech pay, night differential, court overtime, all that stuff disappears. So they appeared for the reluctant hero. Williams tells me he was just doing his job that Monday in September. It's getting there. Yeah, it's getting there. That's all I can really say. Referring to his right leg, a gunshot shattered the femur. It's now replaced with a titanium rod. A second shot to the left leg chipped the femur. Williams sees that as his miracle. <laughs> Three surgeries in a month at MedStar Washington means mounting bills. So the renegade pigs came from departments in Virginia just to help. Basically, it comes down to why we want to help. It's the thin blue line. Officer Heather Munsterman was in Williams' shoes. We're family, law enforcement in general. She benefited from a fundraiser after her ankle and pelvis were shattered by a texting driver in July. All these guys that are, you know, coming out here to do the fundraiser for him came out for me. The renegade pigs also turned out for Officer Sean Hickman, left without ambulance help for 20 minutes back in March after being run down by a driver. It's good for support and it's good for the officer to know that, you know, people are there for you. And while a crutch is his support tonight, Williams has overcome to smile and walk again. They've been great. Everybody has. So uh, thanks. That's all I can say. At the D.C. Police Department's annual awards ceremony, we got our first look at some of the heroes of the deadly Navy Yard shooting last September. We should all know that what they did that day saved countless lives. First, D.C. Police Officer Scott Williams. As he was leading one of the initial active shooter teams, the gunman shot him multiple times in both legs. He received one of the highest awards. Uh, when I was in the hospital, uh, it really means a lot uh, when you're down and out to have a lot of people looking out for you, praying for you. So thank you. Navy Special Agents Brian Kelly and Ed Martin pulled a wounded Officer Williams to safety and carried him down three flights of stairs. Then D.C. Officer Dorian DeSantis headed into harm's way. The gunman shot DeSantis in the chest. His body armor stopped the round and DeSantis fired back, taking out the gunman and bringing an end to the tragedy he received the other highest award. I appreciate it. It's been a real team effort all the way across the board, not with just MPD, but our, our fellow agencies as well. And thank you very much. U.S. Park Police Officers Andrew Wong and Carl Hyatt were honored for providing cover and engaging the shooter during the final gun battle. And for their heroic helicopter rescue of the injured from the roof of that building, the U.S. Park Police helicopter team got an award. The pilot, Sergeant Kenneth Burchell, and his crew, Sergeant David Tolson and Officer Michael Abate. He was among the first victims of the Navy Yard shooting in September. But to family and friends, 54-year-old Marty Bodrog was much more than that. He was a Navy veteran, a loving husband, a father of three teenage girls. And a great friend with a, with a huge heart. You know, if the, the tables were turned and uh, this had happened to one of our other friends, you know, Marty would be right here. When a leak in the foundation of the family's home resulted in significant water damage and mold, Emanuel Bible Church and volunteers from the Annandale Home Depot stepped in to help. The entire basement is being renovated. Meanwhile, upstairs, walls have been painted, doors replaced. All of these materials have been donated, worth an estimated $6,500 in value. And over the course of these two days, dozens of Home Depot workers will volunteer lending a hand on their day off. I know Marty wanted to really uh, fix the home up for his family and have it last a long time. And unfortunately, um, he was unable to get those projects completed. And so we feel like it's our responsibility in honoring his service to our country to finish these projects for his family. As they work, the volunteers say it's hard not to think about their own families. I have three daughters myself and yeah, it would be a tragedy to you know lose a parent and I can I think about that they say they hope this effort will mean one less worry for Badrog's family and we'll be coming back in to do uh, painting work chair rail trim it and make sure everything's 100 percent after such a devastating loss it's a labor of love in Annandale Mike Kinnean News Channel 8 how are you miss it's been weeks since the tragedy at the Navy Yard it's right in this bag here 
Thank you. We appreciate it. But Lena Malcolm is encouraging her customers to keep giving. Just to let you folks know, we are all the trucks are participating in donating proceeds to the families of the Navy Yard shooting victims. Malcolm works at the Red Hook Lobster Truck, one of dozens gathered a few blocks from the base for a monthly food truck festival called Truckaroo. 533. Friday, Truckaroo took to fundraising. I've been giving them singles so that if they want to donate anything, uh, I'm letting them know they can drop it in the Red Hook bag for us and we'll uh, gladly donate, it, donate and pass that on to the families of the victims. Local food trucks are asking for donations that will go into a regional fund supporting the victims of the shooting. Sure. No. It was in part Ryan Kim's idea. It's going to be $7 on the card. I thought we all park here at some point in time. These are all like not just our customers, but our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends. So. Why not? Jeff Stewart says the gesture touches him personally. The Navy architect was inside building 197. It's really literally like the least I could do. I mean, I know um, they're going through anguish. It's just a lot of tragedy going on. So we like to do our part, you know, to make sure that we're giving back to the community. And this is a really important cause, though. First at six, a security alert if you work or do business in a federal building. Three months after the deadly Navy Yard attack, a new report reveals thousands of federal guards may not be able to protect against intruders. The revelation from a Government Accountability Office report has Congress demanding some answers. Chris Van Cleve has been digging through the report. He's live outside the Reagan building with the findings. Chris. Your tax dollars are paying for the security guards who work in federal buildings like this one here at the Reagan building. Many of them are armed. They're at those security checkpoints, but they may not know what to do if someone comes in with a gun. Chilling security camera video shows Navy Yard shooter Aaron Alexis during his rampage, an active shooter situation that killed 12 people and raised the question, are other government buildings prepared? A recent Government Accountability Office report finds many of the armed private security guards who would be the first on the scene have not been trained for an active shooter scenario. If somebody's with a firearm in a federal building and we have a PSO officer there, nothing here... The original objective uh, and mission of the PSO was to ensure the safe egress and egress of people coming into the facility. Uh, it was not to pursue uh, an active shooter. The Federal Protective Service Police oversee security at 9,600 federal buildings nationwide. We rode along as they trained at D.C.'s Reagan Building in 2010. But the agency doesn't have the manpower to put cops in every building. Instead, FPS hired 13,500 contract guards to man security checkpoints. The GAO found many weren't trained as screeners, and five companies hired by FPS reported their guards were not trained to respond to an active shooter. If they, in fact, do engage the shooter, if they, if, if they come into contact with one another, they will engage. The GAO report disagrees, finding FPS has limited assurance that its guards are prepared for this threat. In my view, this is a huge hole in basic security. Brad Garrett is a crime and terrorism analyst for ABC News. You're only as good as your front line. And if your front line is not adequately trained and doesn't know what to do, potentially in a crisis situation, You've got a big gap. And in just the last few minutes, we received a response from the Federal Protective Service, a spokesman telling us by email, FBS concurs with the GAO findings and that the agency has reviewed current active shooter procedures and is determining if additional enhanced training is necessary. There needs to be an overhaul of security from within the Pentagon. That's the finding from reviews done as a result of the Navy Yard shooting. Together, we're going to do everything possible to provide our people as safe and secure a workplace as possible. Tonight, a look at the action that will now be taken to protect employees inside military buildings. Well, the military missed a number of warning signs before the deadly Navy Yard shooting last September. And now the Pentagon is announcing big changes in the way it tracks employees with security clearance. The type of clearance shooter Aaron Alexis had when he walked into the Navy Yard and opened fire. Brad Bell is live at the Navy Yard tonight. He's got more on the mistakes and the changes being considered here. Brad? 
Well, Leon, the report released today confirms much of what we reported in the days after the Navy Yard shooting, that people knew that shooter Aaron Alexis had issues before he carried out his massacre in here. But the report says unequivocally, had those people reported their concerns up the chain of command, his pass would have been revoked and this shooting could have been prevented. Before IT contractor Aaron Alexis killed 12 people in the Washington Navy Yard Building 197 last September 16th, there were warning signs. While in the Navy, he was cited eight times for misconduct. He was arrested for a gunfire incident in Texas. He complained of hearing voices. He believed he was being controlled by ultra-low frequency attacks. Yet through it all, he held on to the secret government clearance, which allowed him to walk into the Navy Yard with his shotgun. Now, Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel says a thorough investigation finds the military was simply not doing enough to keep track of its own people. The reviews identified troubling gaps in DOD's ability to, de to detect, prevent, and respond to instances where someone working for us, a government employee, member of our military, or a contractor, decides to inflict harm on this institution and its people. Hegel has ordered several changes to help prevent future inside attacks. He says there will be better continuous monitoring of people with clearance. There will be a single authority with responsibility to improve security, and the number of people holding secret clearances will be reduced by 10 percent. Sounds like something that should, should have been done. That was the general feeling around the Navy Yard today, that Aaron Alexis made the flaws in the system tragically obvious. Something was missed somewhere. This guy was floating around out there with, with a valid ID and all indications where he should have never been allowed back into the building. Now, the report points out that ultimately the blame for this shooting lies with Aaron Alexis and Aaron Alexis alone because he chose to carry out the attack. But the report does have harsh words for the company for whom he worked. It's called The Experts, Inc. It's a staffing company. And his supervisors, the report says, had concerns that he might hurt somebody, but they didn't report it out of fear of violating his rights to privacy. At the Navy Yard, Brad Bell, ABC7 News. head up and I saw him pointing his gun at my friend and he shot her. This week on Inside Washington, the Washington Navy Yard shootings. More questions than answers. How could a man with that kind of a background end up getting the necessary security clearance for a military contractor? Obamacare and the great government shutdown debate. We have been to this dance before. I will do everything necessary and anything possible to defund Obamacare. We can't let the government shut down. We can't be kamikazes, and we can't be General Custer. Chemical weapons in Syria. Syria's Assad tells Fox News we didn't use any chemical weapons. And a Texas appeals court tosses out the money laundering conviction of former House Majority Leader Tom DeLay. He was overwhelmed. He was gratified. After 8 a.m. Monday morning, 34-year-old Aaron Alexis, a civilian contractor working on a computer project, entered building 197 of the Washington Navy Yard with a valid pass. He was carrying a bag in which he had placed a 12-gauge shotgun, a weapon he had recently purchased legally in the state of Virginia. He walked into a bathroom on the fourth floor, walked out, and started shooting. Before police were able to take him down, he had killed 12 people. Alexis had spent four years in the Navy Reserve where he had demonstrated a pattern of misbehavior that included insubordination, absence without leave, and two days in jail after a bar fight in Georgia. Nevertheless, the Navy gave him an honorable discharge, and he had received the secret security clearance that allowed him to work on a half dozen military bases, including the Navy Yard, despite having been involved in shooting incidents in Fort Worth, Texas, and Seattle, Washington. Just last month, Alexis told police in Rhode Island that he had been hearing voices. He had visited a VA hospital complaining of insomnia. As the Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel says, obviously there were some red flags there, but nobody saw him. 
why they didn't get picked up, why they didn't get incorporated into the clearance process, what he was doing. Um, those are all uh, legitimate questions that uh, we're going to be dealing with. Uh, now, we just heard Senator Dick Durbin ask how somebody with Aaron Alexis background could end up with a secret security clearance. Do you have an answer, answer to that, Evan? No. Uh, I mean, there are too many contractors, and, and, and this is really a function of 9-11. Uh, and we've, we've created this whole universe of contractors, and, and so obviously it's not carefully policed. But there's, there's a deeper thing here, is we live in a weirdly permissive society where people have rights, they got a lot of rights, they're lawyered up, uh, and it's very hard to take them in to put them in hospital, it's hard to fire them, it's hard to do anything to them. This is mostly a good thing. This is the result of years of protection, protecting individual rights, but it's ugly consequence are these freakish accidents where somebody who should have been incarcerated or put in a hospital or had his freedom taken away long ago was allowed to roam free. Dina. You know, I cover the Supreme Court and I read and have for decades all these cases involving usually people who when they are relatively young in their late teens, early 20s, early, at the latest early 30s are clearly uh, psychotic in some way and nobody seems to either have the will or if their parents have the will they can't keep seem to get them help. We're a big country. We don't have laws that re adequately deal with this. We don't have facilities that adequately deal with this. And it has real consequences for the people who are the victims. And really, the person who perpetrates this is also a victim in his own way. Uh, we have the biggest military in the world, Colby. We shouldn't feel helpless here. We shouldn't feel helpless, but we also should look at the way in which we go about doing things. For example, people talk about him having a security secret clearance and, and uh, a background investigation. What background investigation? He did not have a background investigation. They checked records, and they checked on the basis of the records check, they gave him the clearance. The fact of the matter is that this, this individual uh, may have had run-ins with the law, but how many convictions did he have? The convictions are what mm -hmm. show, will show up on the, on the yeah. records. Not the arrest, not the running with the law, not shooting a bullet through the, the, the floor. Uh, We've turned this whole business of vetting people over to a private company. We are putting national security on the basis of a profit and loss statement, and that is a problem that we have to look into. Charles? Here's a guy with a dramatic history of hallucinations, paranoid ideas, uh, and Dick Durbin is an example of what everybody in this town is saying. How could a guy who's mentally ill get a gun how could he get the clearance? How could he get, get into the Navy Yard? They're all important questions, but they're secondary. The real question is, here's a guy who's mentally ill. How could he not have been treated? How could he not have been cared for? How do we let loose people that are obviously psychotic on our streets? And the answer is exactly as Evan said, Nina said. This is an excess of concern with civil liberties to the point that we let these people die with their rights on and sometimes tragically rarely but really tragically take a dozen innocents with them and this is an, and, and this happened in Tucson with Jared Lofner where I think it was his mother who said he was clearly psychotic she couldn't do anything or was told we can't do anything to pick him up to treat him or even incarcerate him until he does something so you got to kill before you get treated and that's the tragedy at the root of all this. This is my Swiss Army knife. I can't walk into a government building with this. How did this guy get a shotgun onto the Navy Yard, a major military facility? He had it inside of a, a, of a, of a, <laughs> a bag, that's all. He, and he had, he had his pass that allowed him to be cleared into the well, building. Don't they have metal detectors? But, no, look, we yeah, just can't limit, the, we can't limit the inquiry to just the things we've talked about. I think the, uh, Charles has mentioned a very important point. But, Consider the absurdity of this. A few days ago, he goes into a gun shop in Virginia, right across the bridge, and he wants to get by a pistol. He wants to buy a handgun. He said, oh, no, the law won't allow us to sell you a handgun because you're from out of state. We can sell you a shotgun. <laughs> and, 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 and so he has a shotgun. Oh, oh happy day. <laughs> What's, isn't that rather absurd? And as I
This week on Government Matters. Aaron Alexis was working as a subcontractor to Hewlett Packard and he worked for a smaller company called The Experts. A low level computer job gave the Navy Yard shooter access to U.S. military bases. We'll go over technical details with the Washington Post. I would love to say it would have prevented it, but we never know that for sure. Montana Senator John Tester says the background check process needs an overhaul. Will his SCORE Act reach the Senate floor? It's been around for decades. We have many new risks and many new threats today. How can federal leaders manage those risks as budgets shrink? Government Matters starts right now. Now, I want to go in further with that. The incident raises more concerns about the background check process for military contractors. That said, the concerns are different than those raised over NSA leaker Edward Snowden. Here's a quote. A secret level clearance requires far less intensive digging than for top secret clearance and involves only a check of the FBI database, military records, and data from law enforcement agencies. Marjorie, what did they miss? Well, you're going to see something different with a top secret level clearance. Generally, that would um, require interviews with people who know him and are who are close to him. Um, but also, you know, there are still some some unanswered questions. It did miss some arrests in 2004 and 2008 and 2010. Um, so I think that there are certainly questions being raised about the process. Well, apparently, with the arrests were never they weren't adjudicated. They there weren't convictions, and so that part apparently never gets on your record. The Post spoke with Thomas Hoshko, chief executive of the the experts about the Alexis background check. What did he have to say? You know, he was, um, he seemed very surprised when he spoke with one of my colleagues. Um, he said he would not have hired him uh, if he had known about all of these arrests and these kind of concerns that um, had been raised earlier. Um, you know, he pointed to the Defense Department, which had verified a clearance when he checked it as recently as June, and he checked a, and he used a background check. Um, so, you know, Thomas Hoshko um, was very concerned about this and said that, um, you know, that they rely on, on the Defense Department and on contractors to help them kind of make sure that they're hiring the right people. How thorough was this investigation? Uh, when, the, when his clearance was reviewed, what did they find? Uh, you know, there's a lot of rumors out there about what this fellow did or didn't do leading up to the actions at the Naval Yard. We just, we just want to make sure the agencies were doing their job. And uh, uh, look, uh, if, if we can get that kind of information, uh, that, I think that would be very helpful. Have you received a response? Not yet. Your colleague, Senator Tom Carper, says the Senate Homeland Security Committee will be investigating the issue in the coming weeks. What does that entail? Well, I think he's, he's planning on doing some hearings. And what I talked to Tom about yesterday is we've already got a bill that's been sent out. It's called the SCORE Act. Let's get it. Uh, let's get it. Let's get it through the Senate, and then, then let's do some hearings uh, in concert with that. But at a bare minimum, I think if we could get the background check, uh, allow the Office of Personnel Management and Inspector General to be able to do uh, look into those background checks, uh, that's a step in the right direction. It's going to be meaningful, and it's going to, I think, really make a difference in uh, in reducing the number of instances like Snowden or Alexis. And